So good morning, everyone. Um, today's guest presenter is Professor Kasmude. Uh, Kasmude is professor of the School of Public and International Affairs and uh, at the University of Georgia. And most of his work focused on the conceptualization and analysis of the far right in Europe and in comparative perspective. Uh, also, as you um, all know, he wrote quite extensively on populism. Uh, among other books, uh, is the author of uh, Populist Radical Right Parties in Europe and um, of Populism, a very, a very short introduction, uh, both for uh, Cambridge University Press. And he's also co-founder of the ECPR Tending Group on Extremism and Democracy and co-founder, former, former co-editor of the Routledge series uh, on extremism and democracy. Uh, today is going to present his latest book, um, this one, uh, which is entitled The Far Right Today. Um, so now I'm gonna give the floor to Cass, uh, who's gonna speak for about uh, 30 minutes, I guess. Um, and then we're gonna open for discussion, questions, comments um, you may have. So, Cass, when you're ready. Yes. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for the invitation uh, from Duncan, of course, and uh, to Lisa for the introduction. Um, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm going to give a shorter presentation on the book, uh, focusing on the main thesis and then spend a bit of time on what I believe this means for the study of the far right, um, which as you probably know, um, I mean, roughly far right parties are the most studied parties of all groups. Um, but I think that increasingly um, the study of the far right has become reasonably stale and um, it has come kind of stuck in the 1990s. So I'll say a little bit about that. Um, so this new book, The Far Right Today, is really a book uh, for the broader public. And as I was writing it, um, the initial thought was just to write pretty much a, a very short introduction of the far right, um, but write it for polity because I wasn't overly happy with Oxford. Um, and um, it was just too tight a format. But when I was writing it, I just uh, thought that I have some ideas about developments that I might not pull off in a Cambridge University Press book, but um, I can pull off in a, in a polity book. And so this book allows me to do some kind of like thinking aloud. Um, so note on terminology, I won't say too much about it, but it's nevertheless important that my interpretation of left and right comes from Norberto Bobbio, the Italian philosopher, who by and large focuses on uh, egalitarianism as the key focus. And so right ideologies are all those ideologies that believe that social inequalities are by and large natural and that the state should not get involved in them. Whereas left-wing ideologies believe that social inequalities are a consequence of politics and uh, politics should try to um, make an egalitarian society. Now, I only focus on the far right, which means the mainstream right, the center right is, um, is not in my book. And the far right is a container concept for both the extreme right and the radical right whereby the extreme right is anti-democratic to the core, doesn't believe in popular sovereignty and majority rule, whereas the radical right accepts that the people elect their own uh, leaders, but has particular problems with liberal democratic aspects. As we know, the democratic system that we live in is not just majority rule, it's rule of law, it's minority rights, separation of powers. And it's particularly on those type of issues that the radical right um, is, um, has a problem. Now, extreme right is, is easiest to think about as fascism. It is predominantly in a non-party um, form, but in, there are now more and more 
extreme right parties that are being relevant, Golden Dawn for a while in Greece, uh, Club Leba, the popular Slovak party, um, the MPD to a certain extent. But I would also argue that extreme right ideas, which generally are seen as anti-democracy or, or anti-Semitism and open racism, have become more and more used today as well. So Klaus von Baim in 1988 wrote an article about the three, uh, the different waves of post-war far right in Europe. And um, I focus particularly on the third wave and then what I believe is the fourth wave. Now the third wave roughly started in 1980s with parties like the Front National, Vlaams Belang, uh, Center Party, and to some extent Austrian Freedom Party after Jörg Haider took over. The third wave was defined by electoral and political breakthrough. And radical right parties were seen as new and as outsiders and as challengers to the mainstream. Now, my argument is that this third wave ended roughly at the turn of the century, um, when far right politics became qualitatively and quantitatively different. And that's what, why I argue that in the 21st century, we're actually facing a fourth wave. Now, one of the key things that um, defines this fourth wave is extreme heterogeneity in terms of organization, in terms of mobilization, and in terms um, of violence. So the first line, you will see um, Brazilian president Jair Bolsonaro, who by and large got elected without having his own party. In the middle is the Party for Freedom from the Netherlands, which has officially only one member, namely Geert Wilders. And then on the upper right, you see the BJP, the leading party in India, which allegedly has more than 100 million members and is the largest political party in terms of membership in the world. So even with regard to parties, like, and, and electoral politics, like you see extreme heterogeneity in the form going from pretty much politicians without a party to politicians who are their own party to mass parties in, in the real sense. Now, in terms of mobilization, like, of course, we have on the one hand parties, we have street politics and we have violence. But even in terms of the street politics, we have big differences. You see a picture from Charlottesville in the middle on the left, um, the Unite the Right rally, which was a rally pretty much of just all far right groups in the US coming together. And although the people up front there are all clean cut, kind of younger, um, better educated men, actually the Unite the Right rally was largely a conglomerate of Ku Klux Klan neo-Nazi groups like that. That's in sharp contrast to the middle, which is one of the many Hindutva groups, the Hindu nationalist groups of which the BJP is the political party. Um, these kind of groups uh, mobilize tens of thousands of people, and sometimes even more than that, in highly organized and disciplined rallies. And then finally, we have groups that span kind of the far right which you see particularly in anti-Islam mobilization. This is Pegida, the English Defense League is another group, but in general, they're both uh, anti-Islam, anti-Muslim, as well as anti-refugee demonstrations that we have seen since 2015-16 are demonstrations that have not a clear organization behind them often um, and more importantly, if there is an organization, that organization is not necessarily part of the traditional far right and attracts people that go well beyond that. And you saw that again, particularly with regard to anti-refugee um, anti refugee demonstration in 2015-16 in Western Europe, but particularly in Eastern Europe and Bratislava, so one of the biggest demonstrations in the democratic period for example, um, where there were the neo-Nazis of Kotleba, but there were also all kinds of people who support mainstream parties. And finally, there is a, there is a diversity in terms of uh, violence, which is, I think, increasingly important. On the one hand, you have people like Anders Breivik, 
so-called lone wolves who should better be called single actors. Um, they act alone, however, they are not alone because they are clearly integrated into a broader subculture of the far right. You can think about the Christchurch shooter as well and Charleston shooter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, at this point in time, these are still the most um, the most common far right terrorists, but you also have broader um, violent kind of subcultures, which here in the middle is the grandson of Maya Kahane, an extreme right American Israeli uh, activist. And um, he is part of a group called the Hilltop Youth, which is kind of an unstructured subculture um, of, of uh, Jewish settlers who have far right ideas and intimidate and terrorize the Palestinian population around them. And then finally, there is, according to quite a lot of uh, new research and also uh, reports by intelligence organizations, a growing, um, a growing threat from far right groups. And so both in France and in Italy and also in Germany, groups of neo-Nazis and, and neo-fascists have been arrested who are stockpiling weapons and preparing attacks. And what makes this particularly problematic is that there is increasingly a link to Ukraine where the, the war between Ukraine and Russia and the Donbas has attracted quite a lot of far-right fighters who later return with both their knowledge of weapons and to a certain extent uh, a connection to weapons. Um, a little bit the same as like former ISIS fighters are returning to um, Western countries. Um, oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> it's also important that the far right is global. And if you look at the literature, almost everything is about the far right in Western Europe um, and a little bit about Europe. But if you look today, and actually some of the most powerful far-right leaders are not in Europe at all. Um, of course, it's Donald Trump, the president of the US, who is by far the most uh, important far-right politician. Um, interestingly, came to power through <laughs> winning an internal leadership um, contest of a traditionally non-far-right party. We have uh, Bolsonaro, who I spoke before, the Brazilian president, we have Modi, the prime minister in India, and then we have Benjamin Netanyahu, who has for a long time governed together with far-right parties, but he and his Likud party has shifted to the far-right as well, a development that I will talk about more later. Now, when I say the far-right is global, I mean that far-right actors exist across the globe. I don't mean that there is a global far-right power because connections between the individual politicians are actually pretty voluntary and uh, utilitaristic. Um, in the end, most politicians are busy with either their country or their personal survival, as is particularly the case with um, Netanyahu and Trump. Now, for me, the fourth wave um, exists is particularly different in terms of the mainstreaming and normalization of the far right. To a certain extent, particularly if you look to Europe and particularly Western Europe, many of the actors of the far right parties and even far right organizations that we're talking about are the same as in the third wave. Some have changed their name, like the Front National became the Rassemblement National or the Lega Nord who became the Lega, the Vlaams Bloc who became the Vlaams Belang. But fundamentally, they're the same organizations. And by and large, they haven't fundamentally um, changed their ideology. What makes it different is the role that the far right plays within the broader society. And since pretty much the 9-11 attacks and the interpretation of the 9-11 attacks, um, views of that used to be unique to the far right have become mainstream. And it's not just the mainstreaming of issues like immigration or European integration or crime or identity. It is also the frames of those issues and the issue uh, positions. And one of the best examples we saw in the so-called refugee crisis of 2015 
where pretty much within months, right, the idea went from <clears throat> refugees are coming, we need to help them, to Muslims are coming, they're threatening our national identity and our national security, and we need to find a way to keep them out. Um, in this mainstreaming of the issues and frames and positions, you can very clearly see positions of the far right now being defended by mainstream parties. And this mainstreaming has had to an effect that the differences between far right parties and mainstream parties have become more and more difficult. And I think one of the best examples is France, where if you compare the difference between the mainstream right, UNP, and the radical right for national of the 1990s to their successors, Les Républicains and Rassemblement National today, then there is like very little light between those two parties today, whereas there was, despite a lot of media um, coverage, to the contrary, quite a lot of difference between Nicolas Sarkozy and Jean-Marie Le Pen. What we also see is an increased color coalitions and collaborations with the radical right. In the third wave, there was only one European coalition government that included a far right party, and that was Silvio Berlusconi's first government in the early 80s, which included Lega Nord, which even at that point in time, its far right status was contested. Today, first of all, we have far right um, governments, of course, um, I mean, Bolsonaro, <coughs> Trump, but also in, in Europe with um, Orban in Hungary, with uh, Kaczynski and PIS in Poland, and we have far-right parties that are in coalition with other parties in Bulgaria and Estonia, for example, at the moment, but until recently also in Italy and um, in Austria, and before that the uh, parties like uh, the Danish People's Party and the Party for Freedom have been support parties in, um, in coalitions um, before. And when you look at the local level, you see more and more coalitions and collaborations um, with the radical right. Unsurprising then that radical right policies are no longer exclusive to radical right parties. As I said, positions that used to be unique to the far right, for example, um, <clears throat> arguing for surveillance of Muslims or for keeping Muslims out or keeping non-Europeans out are now being <clears throat> pushed pretty much by other parties as well. Now where on the one hand we can speak about <clears throat> mainstreaming as a process where, uh, which is an empirical process where you just look at policies <clears throat> being adopted by other parties or frames. Normalization is a, a normative process. And by and large, <clears throat> um, you can see that in the media, and you can see that um, by politicians, where one of the important things is that the people are increasingly defined in terms of the far right voter. You see this most clearly in terms of working class, almost always when people speak about the working class, they actually mean the white working class, which in many countries is increasingly a minority or at best like a small majority of people. Um, but broader, we, we hear, for example, in the Netherlands, we speak about <coughs> the people or the concerned citizen, which actually is the far right voter, or at least people who are anti immigrant. You also see it in the discourse around the left behind, um, or the discourse of the anywhere versus the somewhere, leaving aside that these are very vague categories. Like in the argument of David Goodhart, it's very clear that the somewhere, um, the person who actually is. is like rooted in the community is the positive one, right? And they have like decent populism. <clears throat> They're not really racist. They just like to live among each other. Um, and that is seen as common sense. Of course, white people want to live with white people, right? <clears throat> now, these type of positions in the 1980s, 1990s would have been increasingly uh, or incredibly controversial. Now with the normalization, 
you see also much more open support of radical right parties and positions by elites. Um, so, for example, the Forum for Democracy, the newest far right party in the Netherlands, had various academics on its party list, which was unthinkable in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, a few years ago, the Wall Street Journal endorsed Bolsonaro for the Brazilian elections. All those kind of things. I mean, um, Ross Duha in New York Times, by and large, endorsed Marine Le Pen. All of these things like just show that the far right is increasingly normalized. And the idea is not just, well, they're around, so we have to deal with it. No, many of the positions are now seen as normal and therefore, like from a normative perspective, uh, perspective. Okay. The consequence, of course, is that we're dealing with shifting boundaries. Now, in 1988, von Beimer wrote, roughly, we can't define them, but we know who they are, meaning the right-wing extremist parties. That was never completely the case, but it was a lot easier in 1988 and even in the early 1990s to distinguish the far right from the mainstream right. But now it becomes much more difficult. Who is in and who is out and why? Particularly now that we have a new movement which comes out of the US but has a broader uh, agenda, which is national conservatism. Um, they had a big rally and you see the picture there that's actually Tucker Carlson, um, who is uh, the second most important far right voice in the US after, after Donald Trump. Um, but National Conservatism Organization also held a big conference in Rome last year where um, Salvini was supposed to speak and Meloni and also, of course, um, uh, Marion Marshall, together with like members uh, of parliament of the Conservative Party, Douglas Murray, cons established conservative, who shares quite a lot in terms of Islamophobia. And this kind of shifting boundaries has led to um, various <clears throat> problems with categorization. Like where does the Conservative Party fall under Boris Johnson? Where does Fidesz fall, which I believe is in, has become far right, at least since 2015? Likud, Republican Party, or even the VVD in the Netherlands. Now, what is important is that in these cases like, of mainstreaming, it's not so much that the far right has become more moderate and therefore they look more like moderate party. Like as the little research that we have clearly shows, it is mainstream parties that have moved. Now, finally, as some of you might know, um, I've written an article in 2010 about the normal pathology thesis and so the normal pathology thesis, which was introduced in 67 and has been incredibly influential in the study of the far right in the third wave, even though implicitly through the work of people like Hans Gerd Betz and um, Michael, uh, Michael Minkenberg and to a certain extent Herbert Kitchell. Um, the argument is that in contemporary Western democracies, there's only a small minority that holds far right views, radical right views, and those views are unrelated to mainstream values, which means that the radical right really only can become a force, a political force during a period of crisis. And um, I have argued on the basis of uh, both studies at the elite level and mass level that this is simply not correct. Actually, much of the radical right agenda and its values are very much connected to mainstream values. And you should rather see the radical right as a radicalization of mainstream values and therefore as a pathological normalcy. So, for example, the key ideological feature of the radical right is nativism, which is the idea that the state should be of one nation and that anything that's not national or native um, should pretty much be uh, kept out. Now, that is a radical interpretation of the concept of the nation state, which actually has been a foundational concept for many countries. Now, today, good 
I would argue that the extreme right is still a normal pathology. There's only a small minority of people who are truly anti-democratic or openly anti-Semitic and racist. However, the radical right is clearly a pathological normalcy, a radicalization of mainstream values. And to a certain extent, even that is shifting because in countries like Hungary or Poland, um, the radical right is pretty much the mainstream. It's no longer a radicalization of it. So let me go then to some of the academic challenges that the fourth wave places us for as scholars of far right politics, but I would say more broadly of like democratic politics or party politics in Western democracies. So first of all, the classifications. Now, classifications have always been incredibly poor. Um, there are actually very few studies that, that make an analysis of the ideology of a, of a party and then argue that that ideology meets the definition they use about the radical right. In most of the cases, parties are being classified as radical right because someone did it and therefore now we all do it. And many of these radical uh, right classifications come out of the 80s and 90s. Now, given that the radical right hasn't changed that much, that is not necessarily a big problem. What is much more problematic is that many other parties have changed. And so we still talk about, for example, national conservative parties as law and justice in Poland or Fidesz. Um, leaving aside that that was always clear, unclear what that meant. Right? There's a lot to be argued that these parties are no longer conservative, but they're radical right. Um, of course, this has massive consequences. And um, I think it is crucial that we spend much more time on classifications of individual parties. Um, we spend decent amount of time on defining stuff, which is fun. And I do it a lot as well, but then kind of after seven pages of definitions, like often the next step of classification is not even discussed. We just, again, we assume that we know, but really in today's world, what sense does it make to include a party like the Norwegian Progress Party into the far right, but not the Republican Party in um, the US, which has clearly a much stronger anti immigrant profile than um, the Norwegian Progress Party or the Lispin for time for those matters. Now related to that, our theories mostly reflect third wave reality um, and ignore the increasing heterogeneity of the far right. What I mean with third wave reality is that most of the theories talk about the far right as challengers to the mainstream, as oppositional parties. And so almost today, almost all of the theories still argue, well, um, they succeed because of protest. And you see that even in the debate today about COVID-19, where a, a lot of the debates in Europe are like, well, the far right is really going to win from COVID-19 because they're going to kind of jump on all the dissatisfaction of, uh, with, of people of how the governments have dealt with um, the pandemic. Of course, the fact of the matter is that the far right actually has been in government in several countries. And um, as a consequence there, they might lose as a consequence of the same process. Um, if you want to understand why Fidesz got reelected twice, then all your classic uh, theories about protest and whatever don't play that much. I mean, one of the reasons why they have won is because they provide state subsidies. Like, um, there's, a, there's an assumption that these parties are all new, whereas some of the most successful political parties of the far right are decades old. Um, all of these kind of things, like, <clears throat> we have to really rethink, and I'm getting increasingly skeptical about theories that explain the far right at this point in time. <clears throat> 
I think one of the other ways to be a bit creative, particularly about classifications, is we should think more about the concept of functional equivalence. And that means that you have similar but not identical parties um, that perform similar functions within their national party systems, for example. Now, the functional equivalence argument um, is used in the party literature, for example, for Christian democratic parties and conservative parties. Now, clearly they have related but different ideologies, but the argument was they perform the same function in the party systems, namely being the major pole opposed to the center left. Now, I think that for certain research, um, you will need other types of classifications than for others. What I mean is if you do electoral studies right, where you pretty much um, compare parties that are the most anti-immigrant within their political spectrum, right? <clears throat> then, you can group, then you can group the Norwegian Progress Party together with, for example, the Republican Party, as well as for the sake of argument, Flams Blanc. Like, however, if you look at what do parties do when they are in government, then the ideological difference are, are much more important. And for example, then you wouldn't include a party like Golden Dawn into that equation, even though Golden Dawn to a large extent, like its success can be explained in very similar ways as the success of Lams Belang or Front National. But when in power, one would expect Golden Dawn, a clearly extreme right party, to do something very different than a radical right party. So what is important then is that functional equivalence is always, like, should always be theoretically connected to the research question. And so <clears throat> dependent upon what you want to see, like, you might come up with a different group of classifications. And then finally, I think we should think much more about mainstreaming. There's an interesting study, uh, edited volume by Matthijs Rodin and Chitska Ackerman and Sarah de Lange, um, I think 2015 or something, about the mainstreaming of the radical right. Um, it, 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 it has four different interpretations of it. And, and so it shows that like mainstreaming can come from either a moderation of the radical right or a radicalization of the mainstream right or both. Um, but first of all, it's a bit dated. Um, I think that in that in this respect, the so-called refugee crisis of 2015-16 has been fundamental in, in the transformation of, of politics in Europe. Um, but also much of the, the book, as it is the first one, is, is still pretty rudimentary. Um, so it's a complex process. It has multiple directions. It also has national and international dimensions. Um, in certain cases, parties respond to what is happening in other countries. For example, there's a lot of a relationship between Denmark and Sweden, um, between Belgium and on the one hand, the Netherlands, on the one, other hand, France. Um, and then what makes the process so difficult to um, um, to study is that it, it will have temporal lags. Like, I mean, parties don't respond directly to something. It, it responds a bit later. And that temporal lag might not be the same everywhere in, um, in every country, which means that if you do a quantitative multinational study, right, that you might not um, find it. And so I think that we need much more in that like studies that do process tracing at a national level, rather than having all the time <clears throat> multinational quantitative studies of, of processes that by and large are far too complex to at this point model with the, with the relatively uh, mediocre data that we have. Um, and that's me for now. Okay, uh, thanks Gus for the uh, presentation. Um, now we're going to open uh, for question, comments, 